Bird. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. Cabinets HR, focus on your business. We've got your HR. Our guest today is Sean Magruder. Sean, are you ready to be great today? Absolutely. Sean Magruder created GSM Painting LLC in August of 2017. Most really recently, Sean has been working with the city of Kirkland on several contracts, most notably Heritage Hall, Kirkland's most iconic historical landmark. GSM Payne is a Google five-star rated business working on commercial and residential projects. Prior, prior to his work with GSM Payne, Sean was a master at arms in the United States Navy for 13 years. He holds a, master, a bachelor of arts degree in law and public policy from, from, from the Evergreen State College and associates of technical arts degree parallel for Evans Community College. Sean, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So what does GSM stand for? So GSM actually stands for Gustavo, which is my business partner. My name is Sean. His last name is Maldonado, and my last name is Magruder. So GSM painting. Keep it relatively simple. I think it's, that's something that's important in my industry. And so you, you started officially 2017. Like how long ago do you have the business idea? How did that start? Yes. Yeah, so I've been pretty close friends with Gustavo for multiple years before that. So just in talking with him, you know, going through college, exiting the military, I transitioned actually into the reserves for a few years. And during that time, we became close and traveling together. Um, we sort of had a discussion maybe two years before, um, you know, where he's at. He was managing a, a painting company, a larger painting company in the Seattle area for approximately 12 years. And so I would say just maybe two years before, just kind of bouncing it off each other and then it didn't become a reality until maybe just a year before 2017 summer before just sort of writing everything down and seeing what all we would need so if we near here what, what's a master at arms yeah master at arms is equivalent to military police i went to small arms weapons instructor school relatively quickly so i spent three years in road to spain and two years in naples italy and then a final year at swift pack banger which is here in washington um so but again, all, to, all horrible assignments right <laughs> yeah i actually got really lucky so i feel really good about it um spending five years in europe and from 2003 to 2000 well 2003 i was in boot camp so five years so 2005 to 2010 so it was a, it was a good run so you went to the evergreen state college and people who are from this area evergreen state college knows like being a liberal college Absolutely. Have, that like don't have like pass fail like right. there's no grades very liberal college, you know, a place you wouldn't think a military person would go to, right? I'm sure. So how was that experience for you? Like, is it like as liberal as people to say it is? How did you fit in? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a combination of all of that. Um, obviously, being an adult student is a little bit different. You know, I was in my 30, 32 when I graduated. So um, the main reason why I went there actually is I got my associate's degree at Edmonds Community College as a paralegal. I was the type that didn't do very well in high school, didn't think I would be a college graduate. So as I started taking those classes, I got on the Dean's list at Edmonds Community College. And then there was an opportunity that there's only two colleges here in the Northwest. One is Evergreen and the other one is North and Bellingham Western that takes technical associates the same as a regular transfer degree. So I got to transfer all of my credits to Evergreen. So that's one of the reasons why I went there. And I think that that's a really beneficial thing um, aside from all the liberal arts arts that was going on but yeah I actually went there I attended there shortly after all of the controversy um that that following quarter Brett Weinstein and so forth got fired and so I attended there it was a little bit um different too because I didn't really get into a lot of the sociology classes and so forth I mainly stuck with law public policy and I did some business courses there but um I don't know. It's not up to the hype that people make it out to be as far as the negative and the positive. I had a really good time. I think if you just respect people and uh, everything was good. Interestingly enough, I sort of, what's more interesting to me is the fact that I went into painting after having sort of a pu public policy law direction. Um, and what year did you graduate again? I graduated in 2018. Yeah, I just talked about the podcast talking about how like 
probably no one I know, like what are the degrees? Like no one does a degree and does a degree, right? There's right. always something like totally different, right? Actually, I graduated in 2017, but in any event, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that you never know what direction it's going to take you. Um, but during that time, I had actually started the business right after I graduated from Edmonds Community College. So it was sort of a summer thing, you know, it was, it was Gustavo's full time. And then I was all the way down in Olympia. We're based out of Kirkland, Washington. So it was becoming successful. We were building clientele and I had to make the decision. I got a job offer at the um, Department of Natural Resources in the fire protection unit. And I sort of made a decision to just walk from that. I sort of walked in, saw the office, felt the vibe. Obviously, I interviewed at multiple places, even at the attorney general's office. But I just had to make a decision whether I wanted to go that path and sort of that government. I don't know if it's a grind, if you will, but just that path. Or do I want to just go full time and kind of risk it and go with my company? So I made the determination to move back to Kirkland, which is my hometown and where our company's based and where Gustavo's at. So, um, and I'm so happy I did. I just, it's been awesome. Like really the last two years have been great. So did the Navy, how did the Navy prepare you to be an entrepreneur if they did at all? No, absolutely. I think one is just sort of risk taking. I won't say risk taking in a negative sense, but just for the fact that, you know, I joined the Navy at 18. So to be all of a sudden thrown into Naples, Italy, you have to go overseas or where are you going to go next? And sort of that pressure sort of allowed me to go, okay, I can take a risk here and it'll be all right. What's the end result? I mean, I've traveled here, traveled there. I've sort of given my life over to the Navy in so many ways that what's the worst that's going to happen. I'm going to have an awesome van that I can live van life. I mean, my, our initial investment was just purchasing a van at the end of the day. That was sort of the bulk driver of the money. Um, so yeah. So there's a lot of, you know, talking the news recently, actually probably last two, three, maybe five years on the trade shortages, right? You know, you know, back into the day, you know, like high I mean, speaking in general, like high school counselors like go to college, don't be a plumber, don't be a painter, don't be a construction worker. And now there's you know there's talk of this big trade shortage. Is that really true? Is there really a trade shortage from your point of view? Yeah, absolutely. I think that stems from a little bit of evergreen too, just evergreen doesn't matter but college in general but the feel i got is sort of if is there a stigma within our within our kind of k-12 through education to be a plumber not knowing that plumbers make hundreds of dollars an hour and so on and so forth so it may not be as romantic to walk into the room and i think we sort of live in a climate not to get too political but in that feel of okay i work at amazon i get to bring my dog to work and i may make i don't know how much they make starting out but they don't realize what a plumber makes, what a framer makes. It's not, I won't say it's looked down upon, but I feel like there's certain spaces where the trades from that end don't get refilled with quality younger generations of people. On top of the fact that, again, K through 12 education as well as higher education sort of puts you in this lane of be a programmer, you know, be a work for Amazon, you're going to be a worker. They don't necessarily teach you about entrepreneurship. So I think that's lacking from the start, just how to open a business and so forth and, and get involved and in, whether it's a trade or maybe you're a soccer player and want to start a soccer camp. I just don't think it's built necessarily to, um, I don't think our system of education sort of tells, tells people about the trades, but as far as the shortages as well, especially in the greater Seattle area, I mean, I think that the population has been in the top two or three every year for growth. So people are moving here and fluxing. So you have a lot of turnover with homes and then a lot of buildings. Anytime you drive across Seattle, obviously you see 10 and 12 uh, cranes out there. So a lot of big projects going up and um, there's just a big, big demand for that and not enough, not enough people out there. And then, you know, whether this is good or bad, most parents don't say, I want my kid to be a plumber, right? They say, I want my kid to be a doctor or lawyer, right? Absolutely. Like I said, um, that's part of the thing, you know, what is your son doing? Oh, he's going to trade school to be an electrician. Well, go see what a journeyman tradesman makes an electrician, even a painter, you know, starting salaries. I don't want to necessarily throw out all the details of all that, but I can guarantee you some of our employees are making much more than people making at Amazon or Google or whatever, walking in, having their office job. And so, so it comes from, I think a combination of that. And uh, yeah. I just think that it's it's a combination of stigma, a combination of demand, and a combination of, again, I think K-12 through education and higher education just in general doesn't, unless your father owned a con contracting company, how does one even start a contracting company? So I don't think that we really 
promote that in school, just to your baseline of going to the secretary of state, getting your business license, you know, going through L and I, like what are the steps in order to create a business to even have the idea of creating a business that's aside from the trades. But I think the trades are more specific because I think some people could do it, but they just don't have the business. And the trade, you got to exit you know, going to also safety conscious, you got to have safety, you know, all that kind of stuff, right. doing a trade. Absolutely. And you also have to know what you're doing, right? So with that being said, I was military police for 15 years. I've been a professional painter for five years now, but I'm more on the administrative uh, logistical side, if you will. Um, I do paint as well. And I obviously know a lot about painting, but Gustavo being the subject matter expert there sort of brought me along. He runs more of the operations, right? He runs our crews. So um, that's been advantageous. If I, could, if I didn't have him, I wouldn't have even started it, right? Because you need somebody who is a subject matter expert to yes. bring you along. So I remember seeing this meme, I guess, probably on Facebook like a while ago, or like it was a picture of a guy, a liberal arts degree, $120,000 in student loan debt, making like 50000 a year, right? Here. Like, and then the other guy, uh, construction worker, no student loan debt, making 80000 And then, And the thing is like, who's, who's really the dummy, right? Like, who's really the dummy, right? Yeah. And again, the question becomes it's sort of like, you know, what, what do you want your lifestyle to be? I mean, in many ways. So, I mean, do you like working outside? Do you like uh, just the idea, you know, coming from that background, I was always moving, you know, when it came to, to my military background, I was never stuck in one place. You know, I was weapons instructor out on the range. I was guarding nuclear assets. I wasn't stuck somewhere in an office. So that office setting, if you really like that and you want to grind that or even work from your home office, but now, I mean, I love what I do. I think trades been love, but you meet new people all the time. You're constantly moving. You're challenging yourself on how am I going to complete this project and so forth. So, um, yeah. So it's what I'm trying to get at is it's not to knock anybody for anything that they do. It's sort of whatever path you want to take. But I also have the independence and freedom to sort of, uh, obviously, as a business owner, make my own schedules. So you're coming, you do commercial and residential painting, right? We do commercial, residential, and then we've also done some city work as well. So like you stated before, the city of Kirkland, um, I got put on with them last year and started off with one project and then we rolled into six other ones, um, the public works building. But I say Heritage Hall because it's sort of the iconic building there. It's, uh, it's a small White House, if you will. It looks like the White House um, that you'd see in D.C. on a smaller scale, but it was formerly a church. It was one of the first buildings brought to the city of Kirkland, and now it's on a big park, um, and it posed unique challenges. So once I rolled through that, then I think they knew that we would be able to complete um, some other, another historical building. It's called the City, city Hall Annex, it's where the fire department is now located, but it was a government building for a long time, and then we painted portions of City Hall and so forth. So not only residential and commercial, but um, we do some city work. You know, it, what's the process for getting customers residential versus commercial? It's the same process for you? I got to do, do different things. Yeah. So it's kind of a combination of things. Um, we primarily paint with Sherwin Williams paint. I have a really good relationship there. And so I have a paint rep, one of the best in the, in the Northwest region here. And so he actually tied me in with the city of Kirkland because they do all the city of Kirkland paint. So the city of Kirkland purchases all the paint from there. And then one thing leads to another. And they say, hey, do you have a painter who can do this glazing technique that can also do some uh, minor repairs on the um, trim? So I was first in line. So they thought of us. I presented myself to the city officials and they went with us. So it can come from that way as well as I have a, I have a website which you, can, which you can view. And we get clients through there as well. And then word of mouth, you know, when we really started, it was word of mouth because Gus had such a presence and um, contractors would work with him on the, on the regular. So he also, uh, from that standpoint, was able to build clientele. And then one of our commercial projects was actually Miller Paint Company. So the big three painting companies here in the Northwest are Miller Paint, Sherwin-Williams, and Benjamin Moore. Obviously, most homeowners think of Home Depot. They go to Home Depot to get their paint. Um, but those big three are specifically paint companies. So again, one of the reps knew us, um, and knew the quality of our work. So we painted their flagship office, Miller paint in the city of Kirkland. So that's kind of some of the commercial side. And again, working for multiple contractors, they will have a project that may be commercial. So we painted Sotheby's flagship office down here in Seattle. And that was through a contractor. So 
um, the contractors that we work for, we primarily work for about three and they will have us estimate different jobs, whether it's residential or commercial. Um, yeah. So that's how. So you, you, you're headquartered in Kirkland, right? Right. How far out will you go for a job? Like, um, like, like what's the farthest you'll go? It's interesting you asked that because uh, we painted a home in Wallingford. The neighbor asked us, hey, will you go to Shelton? So, yeah, we will. Um, As long as the customer to, takes comes, on the cost, extra it, cost, absolutely, right? Absolutely, right. So we actually included a hotel cost there. Um, they wanted our quality of work, again, because you know, interesting for the average consumer, you think paint, anybody can paint kind of. And um, anyone can paint, but can you paint good? Not only that, but they don't necessarily research painting companies, right? So it's just kind of, oh, Billy's ban, I see, or however they go about their business. Um, like I said, I have a strong portfolio online and five-star rated business on Google. So if people do their homework, then they'll know, sort of see what our quality is. Or if you've had a bad experience with a painter, which this neighbor did, they've said, well, we value your work. We want you to come out here. So in any event, we'll spend a week out there. So that's almost two hours away from here. So, you know, I'd say that's a pretty unique situation. Um, I wouldn't have even estimated it had I not thought that they would go with us. So more or less, it's the Seattle area. We do Seattle, Redmond, Kirkland, and the East side. So we're primarily on the East side and Seattle, but, uh, you know, if somebody reached out to us in Tacoma or whatnot, we'd come out that way as well. And you talked about this before, but how do you go about doing estimates, right? And, and make sure that doesn't, that estimate doesn't waste your time. Like, you know, you obviously don't want to drive like all the way to Shelton, you know, spend time, gas money, all that kind of stuff, do an estimate and don't, and don't take your honor, right? So how do you prevent that? Yeah. So I think our industry in general charges free us, or, you know, free estimates, free estimates, which is something that we promoted in our first couple of years, but because we are, I mean, we're book solid um, most of the time now. Uh, for a longer period of time. So we're able to sort of get away with that by charging an estimation fee. However, that fee is applied if you go with us. So um, if a new client were to reach out to us, we would apply that estimation fee to whatever service they end up going with us. So, And I'm, I'm guessing you have to estimate in person, right? Because anyone can call on the phone. I want my living room painted. It's ceiling six feet. It's probably like 10 feet, you know. I'm sure you have to be in person to do estimates, don't you? Absolutely, because there's so much nuance. There's so much going on there. You have trim. Do you have metal trim? Do you have what type of wood product? Do you want it stained? Do you want it painted? Are we talking popcorn ceilings? Are we talking... So it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Intuitively, you know, a lot of people, you can go online, sort of home builder or whatever these different websites and sort of spit something out. Well, it'll be $3,000 to paint your house between three and 6000 which I would say in general, they're way off because you just never know. Are we talking walls, ceiling, trim? You know, there could be such a combination of clear coat, um, metal products. So it's one of those things that we have to do in person. And also just to get a feel for, you know, what exactly are you looking for? Are you just looking for getting, you know, the walls touched up, cleaned up? Or do you want, you know, spray finish? So people, you know, in general, don't know the difference between a spray finish and hand painted when they look at their walls or doors well did somebody do a roller on that or did they use a spray finish machine and so when we're talking about spray finish we're talking about cabinetry that would come factory where it's really really smooth so we have the equipment to do that or change that color but it's not a process of just slapping paint on it so there's a lot of technical aspects to it that I don't think are fully appreciated by some consumers but I would say on the other side, you know, there's a lot of consumers that do. do so when you paint a, a residence or a house, do you, do you all the, are you, do you all move the furniture or is it up to the occupant to move the furniture? How does that work? I've always wanted to know about that. Yeah. So it is, we, tr we're relatively, we don't charge a fee for that unless it's something massive because what we can do is move it, move everything away from the walls. We typically tell a customer after we've gone through the estimation process and they've sent us a deposit and stuff, we have a, another meeting to discuss color and sort of the day and time that we come in. And so again, moving all the furniture, all the, you even think about the paintings off the wall. Okay. Do you want those to go back or do you want smooth walls? Why well, we have to take pictures of it so then we can put them back up. So things like taking off wall, like paintings, photos and things of that nature, we take that off. But as far as furniture, you'd be surprised how little we have to move it. And we typically will move it to the center of the room, put plastic over it so it doesn't get touched. So things of that nature, but, um, yeah, it's, it goes for the exterior as well. So if you have a lot of stuff and tools and blah, blah, blah. But no, we, we pretty much estimate, estimate it out to do small moving. And do y'all get 
do the do you all get paid by project or by the hour or is it just a combination no so yeah it's based on the scope of work so i would never say i mean don't get me wrong never say never so we have contractors that will say hey can you do an hour here an hour there so somebody that we're that we've been working with if they just need um one of us to come out there for a couple hours that's a different thing but in general we do it by scope of work so we look at the total project break it down into how many rooms and so forth and then we just give you our number along with the pay number um and your painted house do you have them pick the colors or what are they like does somebody have supposed to have a crazy color i want to combine orange and pink and yellow with stripes do you say well you still want to do this no you know actually we don't because i mean you're actually the client so if you want to do that you do that you know there's a couple things we work with designers as well so um typically i'll hand out a card of a designer that i work with if i think that they really want help on that end um with that being said again i spoke about a paint rep so we work with one of the one of the better paint reps out here who sees the industry standard for everything because he deals with commercial and large buildings and new homes and stuff so um at that point if we have a color discussion and they're sort of worried one way or another he'll come out and sort of make a discussion on what product will be best and look at the wood and see what type of condition it's in and sort of recommend what color to go for what's realistic and what's not but as far as if you want a pink or purple wall if you don't ask us for the advice that's fine i mean it's sort okay. of it's and sort then of if they ask. when should somebody think about repainting their house or building like after 10 years 15 years from the pink phase or there certain yeah you know so especially on the exterior water is just your number one enemy out here i would say um again the average consumer waits too long waits a couple of years too long a season or two too long and then you have to repair the siding and a lot of these homes in seattle they're built with natural wood products so if you maintain them then you know you, you can not have to replace the siding for tens of thousands twenties of thousands of dollars but with that being said the paint that we use typically says five years as a five-year warranty on it um but i would say you go seven but I would say your average just homeowner in a residential area probably doesn't do it for 10, 12, 15 years and stuff, just lets their paint go. But then you have other clients as well that would, that paint every, I mean, we have a client that we paint, touch up paint because they like it like that almost on an annual basis. And again, it depends on what we're talking about. I mean, if you're talking about decking, you want to do a light pressure wash and a coat every other year just to keep it, keep it solid. So I mean, I was just interestingly at a at a house in Bothell and uh, the client that we were working with had to have his whole deck torn off. You know, we first estimated and said, hey, you know, these boards just aren't going to take paint. You know? So then you spent $35,000 on a deck where you could have had it painted for a couple of grand over the course of every couple of years. And you would maintain that wood because once, once the wood goes and it starts failing, dry rot gets involved and then you can't stop dry rot. I mean, it's a, it's a living organism. So water can be your enemy there. So to make a long story short, I would say in the five to seven range is what I would do. I think you, I wouldn't even say you can wait 10, but I think on average, the most, most homeowners don't want to paint every five to seven years. So for different brands of paint, like Sharon Williams, like Kellen Moore, the Home Depot brand, is there really a difference in the paint or is this the same paint with the different brand names on it? Yeah, absolutely. There's actually a huge difference, you know, um, Home Depot, not to knock them, but I don't use any of their products actually. And I don't know if you've ever noticed uh, as just the average consumer, anybody listening to this, but you don't typically see a lot of contractors in their painting outfits and whatnot coming in there. Um, and there's a reason for that. So yeah, it can be very watery and it's on the lower end. Um, and again, yes, there is a baseline. So not to plug Sherwin-Williams, but on that level, um, I think they're the most bang for your buck, if you will, but they have really quality products that are mid range. Benjamin Moore is kind of on the higher end. I think that you, unless you really, really like that or like a specific color out of there, but there's absolutely, um, there's absolutely levels to the painting, but there comes to a point where it's all relative when you get a quality paint. Like if you go to a step down below their highest, which is Emerald, if you go to super paint that's you're not going to find that much variation as far as sherwin williams products but uh yeah so what is paint made out of i guess different kind of chemicals or well yeah i mean you have latex based you have oil based and a series of other combinations and stuff so when you're talking i mean they have metal based and so you wouldn't want to put you know a wall product on a metal and so forth so and then you have sheen too which a lot of people 
that's another kind of technical kit. Do you want eggshell? Do you want velvet? Do you want satin? And so, again, when it comes to protection, you see a lot of people out here because they just, well, I don't know if they know or not, but they like the look of flat on their exterior where we typically go low luster. So add a little bit of sheen to it and that's going to protect your home a little bit longer. But um, yeah, there's a lot of variations when it comes to paint. How does someone become a painter? I'm sure they can walk, you know, they, oh, I'm going to a painter today. Let me go paint a house, right? And get paid for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's one misconception too, that like college painters and Bobo painter, you can just come in here. I mean, you just have no idea at the level of professional painting compared to um, one homeowner painting compared to hiring somebody who's kind of on the lower, or just doesn't know what they're doing. I mean, we come, we run into a lot of that or people cut corners and whatnot, but as far as how does one become a painter, right? Um, it's kind of a tryout, honestly. So I have a couple of friends that I tried. Do you like it for a day? It's hard work. Do you want to be pushed? Do you want to get in, get out? Do you like it? And sort of, are you willing to work it? It's more of an attitude based thing, but it's interesting you asked that because when I owned my business, I was in a business class at Evergreen and they sort of asked me about your, your, uh, at the end of the, at the end of your whole experience at Evergreen, you, you write up sort of everything you did. That's your transcript. I forget exactly what the technical term is, but it's sort of a personal evaluation on yourself. And that's the first thing that's on top of your transcripts, right? So my teacher, my professor was asking me, well, so do you, what would you look for, Sean? Well, I wouldn't look for any of that, right? It's about who you know, what you know, like in our industry, it's very much, hey, I talked to a contractor. Hey, I got a guy who's looking, looking for a little work. Maybe he'll lace you up. Hey, I got a carpenter. Hey, do you know somebody? So it's a very, I would say the contractor, contractor painting relationship is very in-house. It's not necessarily something you advertise because somebody knows somebody who's in the industry who wants to progress in that way. So, um, but again, I mean, when you're talking technically, it's just, you have to learn, you have to kind of apprentice, you have to, be willing to learn and push and wake up and be on ladders. Are you scared of heights? You know, so. Yeah. I guess it's kind of hard to be a painter if you're scared of heights. Yeah. And then also there's so many different aspects compared to like, you know, an apprentice compared to somebody who's climbing on a ladder, spraying on a 40 foot ladder. No one's going to put you up there, right? It takes years to get there. I mean, in the first six months to almost a year with our, our newer people, sometimes they didn't even t touch a paintbrush. I mean, you have to know how to clean a sprayer, wash a paintbrush. There's so much prep in painting that people uh, have no understanding of. I mean, it's to be efficient painter and, and to get in and get out. There's so much preparation. The painting's the easiest. It's the quickest part. Um, but it's all the masking. It's all the protecting everything, making sure you're not spraying cars, making sure you're not spraying other houses, you know, so I think that that's just on an exterior level and the interior, same thing. I mean, you don't want to sp spray somebody's old uh, antiques or you got to watch furniture. You gotta watch or carpet, other dog <laughs> carpet, you know, dogs running in and out. You got to make sure it's there's so much logistics going on. And then our company prides itself on, you don't even see, we try and be unnoticed. Right. So at the end of the day, every day we clean up, we make a small space. If we leave any equipment, excuse me, at the job site. So again, I don't know what most people's visual of a painter is sort of these white pants with a bunch of paint everywhere and they just sling their ladders around because the industry does have, uh, you know, some negativity, if you will, like painters just come in and they're da, 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 da. The reason why we work with quality contractors and have been on some good projects is for the fact that we're, we provide a service, you know, we make sure that everything's clean, everything's tight. There's not a bunch of paint on the floor, you know. So there's a lot of cleaning to be done as well. Uh, so that kind of bounces off your, how do you become a painter? I mean, you got to be willing to clean, get down, get dirty and get things done. How does an apprenticeship program work? I mean, I don't have like a specific apprenticeship. Program. Is there like a national apprenticeship program or is this basically each paint company? You know, now that's, now you're talking so, sort of a little bit more union. So I'm sure they have painting, you know, they have a whole course where they have to take same with any other trade that's considered union. I'm non-union. So I'm a private company on that end. And so there's certain contractors, large scale contractors that only use union workers, but actually believe it or not, there's very few that I find because I'm a vendor with Selen and Absher and 
series of others I can't go through them all right now but um that aren't contracted with union with union painters so they're more just union carpenters and things of that nature so anyway that's between the union and them they negotiate and then you have to go on courses and so forth so I don't really know what their process is I'm just saying my in-house processes uh I was just kind of speaking on that as far as cleaning and maintaining everything and getting everything set up so I'm guessing that it, you can't paint outside if it's like it's rainy or snowing, anything like that. But I suppose, is there like a limit? Like, do you have to set temperature? We have to be like at least 40 degrees outside, no more than 100 degrees. Is like a temperature limit, high or low? There is. Um, I couldn't give you the exact temperature, but I'll just say for us, I mean, we stop all of our exteriors October 1st. So, I mean, at that point, we're already booking for next season. So, I mean, in January, we were booked out all the way to mid July. So we're almost at the tail end of our season. We are booking for exteriors second week of September. So there you have it. You have two more weeks of exteriors. So you can, there's a lot of painting companies that do, but again, do your research, right? So if they're painting in the rain and so forth, are you going to get a quality product? Can you use the same paint in the rain? No, you can't. So you have to use fast drying. They call it snap dry and so forth. So we want to put quality product on a home. We don't want to quick dry. We don't want to have, funky stuff going on so again as far as exteriors we typically stop um come october 1st just because the weather's so unpredictable here and then we run into our interiors you have like a busy time or slow time of the year oh yeah absolutely i think the industry in general just contractors the summer you know spring to summer so pretty much march april 1st to october is just a push and then even October, November is pretty good. But then when you start getting into the holiday season, most people aren't looking for painters to come into their house during the holidays, you know? And so it's, you know, it's a little bit slower in January and so forth. I actually am working on a bigger project uh, during that time frame, which, I, which I'm fortunate to have. Um, specifically, you know, during this COVID time, I, I signed that um, actually pre-COVID. So yeah, it's sort of interesting in the trades now with, um, the governor allowing with, of course, all the safety measures for contractors to go out. So construction has more or less been essential and open for a long time. And I, I feel grateful for that. So um, as you can see, it's just continuing to boom and, and people are still moving forward on all these projects that, that were probably, you know, again, a year or two out, like a lot of these larger companies and even smaller contractors have projects that are a year or two out. So they need to be completed and finished. I mean, you can't have an open exposed bathroom and just because it's COVID, they still need to tighten it up to get these people back into their homes. So, um, yeah. So how has COVID affected your business? Yeah, I think you, during the beginning, I had a few cancellations as far as estimates. Um, then at the same time, you know, given the fact that I'm a painter, we have N95 masks. So we take all those safety precautions. That's our industry anyway, right? It's being masked up and having respirators. So as far as that's concerned and just, getting more um hand sanitizer and whatnot so safety is kind of our big concern obviously and i think that that's on the minds of everybody i mean i don't think most people want um you know painters in and out of your house but fortunately we've stayed busy you know and so no one has canceled and we've been able to book out as far as anybody that we've already estimated for have a deposit have them on our calendar but i had a few estimates on the calendar um that during the March, April time frame, just said, hey, you know, we're not supposed to have traffic in there. So I think it's slowing down a little bit, but at the same time, uh, especially with exteriors and everything, the water doesn't stop. People still need to get their, their painting done. Home, I think I recently saw something that home prices, at least in the east side or in this greater Puget Sound, are up 2 or 3%. So that tells you that homes are being turned over. They want new paint. They want So things in that industry are still going well, fortunately. I mean, you feel bad for all, a lot of other sectors, but fortunately it seems like contracting at least in this area is still doing well. So how do you handle this? Like I'm, I'm making these numbers up. You do an estimate for a house or business and you say, this would be $10,000. They say $10,000. I, I, I bought the paint is on like $2,000. One of my paints other $9,000 for It's only a few rooms, a few hours. How do you, do you just say, okay, you know, I'm not going to convince you to my value. I'm going to go somewhere else. Or you try to convince them or. No, no. I mean, I don't think you necessarily, honestly, I don't run into that, that, that much. I mean, uh, I would say a majority of it is, is ghosting. Right. So 
I don't give you my number that day because believe it or not, I have to sit down, see how many calculate, how many gallons I take pictures. I do multiple estimates a day. Estimates meaning I come out to your home and look at it, take photos, and then I have to come back to the office, put out my numbers, see how many gallons it's going to be, what different product I'm going to use, how many different rooms it is, walls, ceilings, trim. So when I finally come to my number and I go, here you go, Jason, here's your number, it'll be silence if you don't like it. You know, it won't typically be like, well, why is this and that? But I have had in previous years when I first started out sort of that conversation that call and say, well, oh, I'm surprised is this, is this, this cost and can I negotiate in cash and blah, blah, blah. It's just like, do you negotiate with your doctor? Do you negotiate? So if you're not necessarily respecting that person or that person's business, I mean, do you negotiate over a Chick-fil-A sandwich? I mean, it sort of is what it is. And so sort of move on is my attitude. Like I just... I have no problem. I say, yeah, there's a lot of different painters out there and, and go for it. But as far as the paint to labor question, I mean, that's the whole, whole game, right? That people sometimes get confused because you also have homeowners that are like, well, can I, I'll purchase all the paint. Okay. Well, the paint isn't the driver because you're going to save $5 or you're actually going to lose more money because I get a better rate at the paint store because I buy. And doesn't that make you look, make you look bad because they buy some low quality paint. And the paint job is not as good because you're not using Sharon Williams. Actually, it doesn't. It more or less frustrates them because typically I've only done it once, honestly, throughout my whole career because I don't want to get involved in that. But it's it's like, you know, they buy five gallons. They don't know. So I say, okay, five gallons. And it's like, oh, we need another gallon. Oh, we need another gallon. We need another gallon. So you get into like the homeowner running around for paint. I've only had, I've only dealt with that once. And that was through a contractor where, you know, the contractor was like, they'll, they'll provide the paint. So as far as me working with clients, I just, I just don't deal with that. I mean, I just, I just move on and say, Hey, you know, that's great. You know, go with, go with somebody else who, who may, who may do that. But I mean, I don't want to get into back and forth with anybody or make any assumptions about anybody. It's just, you know, uh, typically the way I interact with them is via email for my numbers and they, uh, they either won't call back or they'll have that conversation. And I just say, Oh no, you know, I don't negotiate my prices, but I'm sure there are uh, another painter out there that will, that will do a fine job, you know, and just leave it at that. Keep it professional. And like, how do you do repeat business? Like you pay someone's house and obviously it only does have to get repaid like maybe five, seven years. Like how do you ensure that customers gonna come back to you again? You like, you send them emails, you keep in touch with them or how does that work? Yeah. Um, I think a couple things that we do a little bit differently is we actually do a paint profile. So we have a system where we can plug in all of your paint products that we use on your house. And I think that that's a little bit unique. I think most painters just come in and leave you cans of paint. And so some owners, some homeowners want, want the paint to do a little bit of touch up, but at the same time, they don't want a garage full of paint. A lot of people have a garage full of paint and then it gets hardened and stuff. So again, we come up with a packet with all the products. How do you use them? So all the colors will be shown, all the numbers with it, and then how you use them, how you apply them. Um, so we leave them with that as well as because of our professionalism. And when we do, do go ahead and do a job when we typically always have quality results. So I wouldn't even say typically. I mean, that's why we get repeat customers. I mean, we, we've yet to have anybody unsatisfied. I mean, if you look at our reviews and so, um, especially with our contractors too, I think in this, I think in this industry too, you'll find that I'm con contractors in general that again, people will hire a painter. Oh, he's here. He's gone. He's there. And then the contractor, where's the contractor? And are they here? Are they there? And what time are they coming? And I mean, we consistently come at 7.30 in the morning. We tell the client, like, I'm very informative on my emails. We're going to be here at 7.30. Okay, it's raining. We're not going to come today. So I'm very, like, communication is key. And so I think that that level of service and the whole process, the week or two that we're with them, or three days, I think that it just shows. So um, that's why they typically come back or they recommend us. So, And I mean, homeowners, it doesn't just come from oh you paint their house right i mean anything that you can think of has paint on i mean we've painted furniture we've we paint cabinetry we paint decks we paint fences we do small repairs we paint garage floors so when you really get into paint um there's always something that needs to be painted or somebody's updating and stuff so that's kind of how you have your your it's not like how often are you getting a concrete driveway <laughs> i mean how often are you replacing all of your plumbing i mean not too often. Well, I guess you have a plumber coming in there, but um, it's one of those things that uh, people do. People like to update. So, so the paint in the can, right? 
how long can that paint last? Like, oh, you have a can of paint, you don't need to open up. Does it last forever? Does it have a shelf life? Well, it depends on where you store it as well. But literally today I'm working on a house and they have paint from 2016. Uh, that was like, you could potentially use it. I didn't, but it's pretty gummed up. So again, it depends on where you store it. If you store it in kind of a medium temperature place, if you freeze it or it's in the hot, hot it'll dry out. And it just, it's just gnarly. So I don't know. I'd say a couple of years, you're probably good. But anything more than like two years, it could be spotty. And, and it depends you, on what type of product you buy as well. I mean, and yeah. do you buy your paint by the project or do you like buy it in bulk or tiers at a time? No. So yeah, we buy it by project. But again, in, in large quantities, I mean, when you're painting the exterior of a house, it could be 15, 20 gallons of paint. So, um, yeah, project to project. We don't buy anything in bulk. However, you know, we have relationships with all the paint reps. And so with that being said, we get reduced pricing as compared to your average consumer. So actually going with a painting company, most painting companies, I mean, you're going to save probably 30% on paint. I mean, if you're talking about a gallon at Sherwin-Williams, $65, like you're going to save with a company like mine charging you 45 because we get a break on it. Right? So um, I think that's a misconception as well because all these paint stores work with professional painters. So they give you a reduced rate depending on how many gallons you're using per year. So yeah. And we pass that along to the customer. So there's a misconception that, Oh, they're upcharging us in paint. Like paint again, like I said, isn't the driver. It's the labor. I mean, if you have a plumber in your house, for example, my mother just had a plumber. Actually she had an electrician that worked there for an hour and a half and it was $300. For one man you go okay well a couple hundred bucks well we're going to potentially be in your house with three or four people doing your exterior for two weeks do the math this man just made three hundred dollars in an hour himself of course he works for a company and stuff so three six nine ten eleven twelve twelve hundred so he makes twenty four hundred dollars in eight hours if he was working so twenty four hundred dollars a day to have an electrician in your house so do that times five. So if he's there for five days, just one man, one woman is there for five days, you know, you're talking $12,000. So in any event, that's kind of can sort of give the perspective of, of the monetary value of what you're paying. What's your vision for your company? Yeah, my vision right now is to get more into federal contracting. So again, being a veteran owned business, um, I, we've gone to a couple of, conferences it's actually a large one right when covid hit it's the largest one in the northwest at uh puyallup and so i met with a lot of government contractors as well as just government officials to try and figure out the government side when i say government city municipality is sort of easier to connect with but when you're talking about potentially painting for the va there's a very specific certification that you can get um if you qualify for as a service connected disabled veteran where they review you review all your background and all of your, all of your stuff. Once you get that qualification then they have to go with you. So there's series of that, that I want to take advantage of like my veteran benefits, as well as I just want to get, um, get involved with a little bit more government contracts. So that's my goal as well as I'm potentially thinking about starting a YouTube channel, just sort of a lot of things that we discussed about to, not only just help homeowners understand like these are the three best things you can buy for yourself if you're starting a painting project, you know, hand mask or tape, you know, like go into a little bit of detail of that, maybe a detailed video about Sheen, you know, sort of an about us. So I'm looking into getting more into uh, media, if you will. I do have a website and I, and I have an Instagram page, but I haven't gotten too heavy into social media because I've been working so much the first couple of years as far as in the field compared to just more dedicated to focus. Yeah, I definitely see you like killing on Instagram, right? Instagram stories, like pictures of houses and different kinds of paint. Right. I definitely see you doing big, doing big on Instagram. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, yes. It's, that's one thing that I just love about painting, honestly. I mean, in the trades too, you know, you could say you could have the greatest plumber in the Northwest, right? Come to your house and plumb. Who would know? No one would know. I couldn't pull you under there and just say, oh, look at this plumbing. Look how great they did. Where, you know, sometimes I see guys, man, they put tile down and it's like, that is amazing. The way they measure it is perfect, right? Well, if you don't have an eye for it, you don't know. Everybody knows paint and it's instant results. So I could do the exterior of a house and it looks rough. And then it looks rough for a couple of days because we're patching it. We're, we're 
getting all the getting all the dry paint off we're priming it we're doing all this stuff and then one day we we run the body and it's wow it's just the homeowner's happy the neighbors are looking like wow this is amazing so same with interiors too you can totally change a space with painting and that's one thing when it comes to instagram or or putting my portfolio out there i'm I'm just proud of the job that we've done and it shows it doesn't take a lot of words to say well this is what I do and you're going to get excellence and quality and this and that and that. I don't need a lot of verbiage, if you will, because my portfolio speaks for itself. Um, and so I love that visual aspect. And I think that there's um, a lot of aspects that are awesome about owning, owning your own business and especially about being in the painting field. So talk about the challenges of being an entrepreneur. Yeah. So the challenges of being an entrepreneur, I mean, I'm lucky to have a business partner. You know, I think that it's a double-edged sword. You know, anybody will tell you that, you know, if you're kind of not getting along, but he's my best friend. So we get along very well and we're just for each other all the time, but it takes a lot of time, sacrifice, especially on the front end. And if you're not willing to work those extra 12 and 15 hours and just grind it, grind it, and just always have that vision of, of optimism that like, hey, it's getting really hard, but I can make it through. Um, I think in the beginning stages, that's what it is, you know, and, and the ups and downs, you know, they always show like that, that loop, like, oh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Oh, I'm doing horrible. Like I'm the worst person ever. I'm doing a podcast now and I'm probably sounding odd. So who knows? Right. So it's like, oh no, I just did a podcast. It went really well. So that's sort of the level of an entrepreneur. You think you're doing really well and then you kind of get knocked back down and can you come back up on the upswing and, and, and just believe in yourself and willing to, willing to walk from situations that, that your gut instinct, you, I think you have to have a gut instinct uh, to know which lanes to go to go into. But uh, so to speak on the challenges, it's sort of, you know, will I make it? What, at what point do you, you know, start, leveling up and making like executive decisions when it comes to okay so should we get more medical benefits and then do we do this and buying a piece of equipment it can get a little a little daunting because it's you know you're just relying on yourself but there's so much there's so much upside to it and i wish um more people were involved in entrepreneurship i think it would be great again through through k through 12 to sort of touch on that and just be your own boss it doesn't have to be a, a large painting company right i mean you can do there's a million different things you can do with business and um and whether or not you make money, whether or not you, you are super successful or you just, you know, do something out of your house as a sole proprietorship or whatever it is, there's so many avenues to it. It's not just, I got to have some big corporation or whatever. So, um, but I don't know. I, it's hard for me to really talk about the challenges and challenges. There's obviously a lot of challenges. There's challenges in life. There's challenges raising kids. There's challenges of working in an office and sitting there going like, is this going to be my life for 20 years or do I grind? I think my generation is sort of in this generation of not wanting to do something for 10, 20, 30 years. Like the idea of working in the Boeing factory, yeah, you make decent money and you can work your way up and your 401k is growing, but even that has a lot of pressure. So I think the idea of challenges as far as me, where I'm at right now, it's more excitement. It's more, I really enjoy it. Sort of like, what could my profit be next year? What could, who could I hire? You know, I'm with Vets Yes, so I'm signed up with that, like hiring veterans and just meeting new people and, you know, doing quality work and something that I've built myself. So I don't necessarily focus too much on the challenges at this point. In the beginning, it was just more about thinking that this is going to fail. But now that I've actually, you know, made it past that stage of my entrepreneurship, I think of more of you know, what's next, you know, so. No, a lot of people will tell you, well, I could never be an entrepreneur because I need security. I'm like, security, are you sure your job is secure? Like, oh. you're never going to get laid off. Yeah. You're never going to get fired. How secure is your job really, right? Absolutely. I was laid off from Boeing, for example. So, I, right when I got out of the Navy, I took a job with Boeing. And I got laid off. So, um, which again, I looked at as an opportunity. I'm going to go to school. So, then I took the GI Bill and I'm thankful for all my veteran benefits and everything like that. So, I just went to school. But, yeah, there's no guarantees. I mean, we don't live in a system now, in, in my view, that, that, you know, you get your gold coin at five years and 10 years. And like my grandfather worked for Boeing his whole life. It's sort of like, there's nothing, nothing's necessarily guaranteed. But at the end of the day, when you do walk into business, I mean, if you're trying to make money, well, it's a difference between making a living, making money, just having a business for fun. But if you're really going to go into it, 
you got to have a skill set. You got to have something to, whether to sell or be a part of running mics or whatever it is, you know, you do have to have a skill set at the end of the day. So um, it's obviously a main challenge. One thing I think military is, does good is like teaching you resilience, right? As an entrepreneur, I mean, you're going to get knocked down time, 10 times, got to get up 11 times, hear no or no. I think the military does a good job of training people to be resilient. Oh, absolutely. And especially in the painting field, you know, not knowing a whole lot about it. Of course, I painted my own home, you know, five, six years ago with Gus because, you know, we're friends. But just the idea of persevering and sort of what, what, what is it working eight, 12 hours? I mean, I've been on post with a shotgun for 12 hours standing there, 16 hour days and we go into Delta or f- with gear everywhere. So you go, okay, like I got to be here. It's hot. It's 70 degree on top of a house and my shoes are potentially melting, but I just knock this out in a half an hour and I can get down and off here. So um, it definitely, the military's made me so much more resilient and the, the idea of sort of navigating the civilian world as far as the job's concerned is like, not as tough when you're doing 12 and 12 and 12 and 12 hour shifts that are really 13, 14 when you have to, and then you have to go work out and do all, do all these things. Right. So from a physical aspect, it's not, it's not as, uh, it's, I don't necessarily look at it as a challenge that way. So entrepreneur, you know, you're doing everything and stuff. You're doing sales, marketing, business development, painting, et cetera, et cetera. On a day-to-day basis, how do you know what to focus on and how to know what to put on the back burner? Yeah, that's, that's, talk about an entrepreneurial challenge. That is the challenge, right? There's so many directions to go into. So, you know, for me, first and foremost is I'm making sure my business partner, Gustavo, at the operational level has everything that he needs. And if he needs me, then I'm there, you know? So I feel like I'm at the stage now where I can invest a little bit more time in marketing podcasts or, you know, YouTube channels and so forth. But, you know, it, it, that's probably the number one question that's sort of hard to answer for anybody. Or do I update? Do I get cards? Do I build a website? Do I get a website? Because in the beginning, I was just word of mouth for a year. I mean, I didn't, I had cards, like just, you know, cards I ordered online. And then at what point do you sort of elevate up to having a, a flyer that you can give out and present to somebody at a conference? You know, you're having these one-on-ones. Well, you need a flyer. Well, who's going to design that flyer? Well, I've sort of designed it, bounced designs off me. And then I noticed, hey, I don't even have my address on it. So I'm giving out all my things in the beginning. My address isn't on my card and so forth. So again, I'm sort of spinning off, but there's so many different directions you can go to, whether it's whether it's your branding, like I'm talking about, your cards, your flyers, your so forth, you know, your media, what direction you go to. But at the end of the day in painting, we have to stay loyal to our contractors, do it in a timely manner focus on the client and everything else is secondary. So that's my main focus is not necessarily getting new clients. It's more focusing on the clients because I think you can get lost as an entrepreneur. You got to always take care of the people who have been loyal to you. And so we never, we pride ourselves on like, if you hire us, like we're there and we're there to do a good job. We're not chasing the next person that could potentially be something great. You know, it's like this idea that people run out trying to look for the next best thing, but never take care of their home base and their people that, that have been supporting them and their quality clients. And I think losing sight of that is, it can be your, your downfall totally. So just not chasing. So again, just focusing on clients, making sure everything's good at the job level. Cause at the end of the day, that's what we do. We paint and we want to make sure that that's quality and then everything else is sort of secondary. But uh, from the administrative side, the logistical side, I'm sort of always thinking of all these things and have a list and me and Gus discuss on a weekly basis, sort of what our direction is, whether it's investing in new equipment, whether it's okay, what, what are the list of things that we need to do, whether it's dump run or clean, or we need to do this. So we come up with a weekly list, have a meeting about it and just knock off the top priorities. So that was kind of a long story, but. (laughs) And uh, I'm guessing you have to have some kind of liability insurance. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, you have to be, you know, we're licensed, bonded and insured. So we, and that's another topic too, but you can be bonded, a surety bond or just a regular bond is a little bit different. But if you were on a, on a major project with a contractor, say city of Kirkland, and they want you to have a hundred thousand dollar bond so they could come out. Like if we all got sick and couldn't complete it, then it's like insurance for that work. So if we said this project's going to be $60,000, we don't complete it. They can then go on, go to our, the bond that we have just like insurance It's basically insurance on that project. So 
Yeah. I mean, we have $2 million worth of insurance and that's relatively standard. Most contractors have a million. I mean, just that's sort of your baseline um, to be insured. So if you, if we started a fire in your house, like we have a million dollar insurance and it's actually 2 million, but um, if it's like I said, city and we need to do some bonding, it's, it's a little bit different, but yeah, even learning those, those terms were, were a challenge in the beginning as well. Like what all do I have to have? I hear license, you hear licensed, bonded and insured. Well, what does that technically mean? You know? So um, anyway. And for your pin equipment, like, do you, do you buy, replace your pin equipment like every two years or each new job has new different pin equipment? No, the painting equipment, um, the big driver is sort of your sprayers. So those you maintain clean and there's also, there's a place in Bellevue that actually repairs them. So it's almost like a lawnmower or anything else. You can bring it in and they can, what's called repack it and so forth. So they can maintain those on the, on that level, but no, we just maintain most of our sprayers. And then of course you're always accumulating ladders and new tools and so forth. So yeah, I mean, you, the big drivers are your sprayers, your pressure washers and those, those uh, mechanical things. But as far as uh, smaller items, those are just, uh, you know, replenished as needed. So what advice do you have for like someone who wants to become an entrepreneur? I would say have the combination of just get at it and do your research. So it's when I was in school and they talk about business, you have to have a business plan. You need to have a marketing plan. You need to have your business pitch. You need to have, not if you're going to be a basketball trainer. I mean, if you're a college basketball athlete, even at a junior college and you want to start a training situation, like a guy like me who plays basketball here in Seattle community league, you could charge $40 an hour to train me and I would 60 or whatever your rate's going to be. You don't need a massive business plan. You don't need to go to a banking to get a bunch of financing. So it's this idea of like, don't get discouraged if you don't have this big marketing plan and this big business pitch, but at the same time, know what your problem is, of course, and know how you're going to solve it, those basic fundamentals. But I think you can get lost in the weeds and then you never start. I would have never started. If I needed all that, I would have never started. Like I said, uh, my business partner, Gustavo, he had clients. I kind of had some clients as well and we were just ready to go. So we went at it at the same time. I wish I knew a little bit more about bonding, licensing, so forth, but my personality and his as well is sort of, you know, you get in, you get your hands dirty, and you learn on the way you take a couple knocks, but you just keep pushing and, you know, learning that way. It's sort of a hands-on learning. I'm a painter. I, that's a hands-on learning. So I've always sort of had that style. So I think again, if you're going to go into entrepreneurship, it's this, it's this combination of, again, of course, prefacing on what you want to do. I mean, obviously if you want to sell, you know, uh, have a, say a coffee shop is much different than having a, a, you know, you're going to need more than just, you have to have a storefront, you have to have, okay, who are your employees? Okay. How long is your lease going to be? And maybe you're going to have it to have investors because your lease is $10,000 a month. And are you going to sell this product that you need to make and who's going to be your manufacturer to make? So again, when we get off on different companies, but I'm saying, especially a trade, or if you're thinking about sewing masks or something of that nature, you don't necessarily need this massive uh, backing of whether it's financial institutions or even your business plan. You can just go forth and get after it. So going back to how long does it take to be a good painter from your um, perspective, what you've seen, how many hours does someone have to paint for you to say, okay, this guy has it. This guy's kind of like knows his craft. Yeah. Like, so I've read and heard a lot of things and I believe in this, that it's 10 years. So however many hours it is, they equate it to something. I can't remember how that works, but it, it's 10 years. I mean, to be a master painter, like on the level of my business partner, it takes 10 years. And, and one of our employees, I think it takes 10 years to be a master at anything. Even when I was in the military, I mean, or you think of yourself, anybody who's listening or, or anything you've ever done to be a master, to be good at your craft where you walk in and you know exactly what to do. You don't really have a lot of anxiety. It's more, okay, how am I going to complete this product texturing everything? There's so much to know in, in painting, just how are we going to complete this in a week when you have a hill on one side and a, this on the other side, what platforms do we need? I mean, there's, it's so complicated on that level. 
So to be a master, you're talking 10 years or to be like a top painter, you're talking 10 years. Um, but on a more practical scale, I would say you're pretty solid if you're doing it for 40, 80 hours a week after three years, probably we could leave you alone at a project to get some walls done and some basic things. I mean, believe it or not, like that's sort of where we're at. We don't leave people alone at a job site for years. I mean, you have to know what you're doing. Of course, we'll leave and get some lunch. Hey, finish this. But to actually be, have somebody over you where you're not like bouncing off questions. Oh, how am I going to do it? Or what's the next step? What's the next stage to be unsupervised? You're talking three years, I would say at a minimum. So this might be different. I know recently a lot of construction companies are having a problem where like, like they have worked with like Leaf or a dollar more, two dollars more. Like they were the bouncing around companies. It's the same in the paint industry where like you're losing employees because someone gets a nickel raise, a dime raise, or are they pretty much set with a different company. I would say the industry, absolutely. Again, coming from my perspective, um, a lot of our connections are obviously through Gustavo as well as myself. I brought on a couple people, but again, they have loyalty. We treat our employees really well. Like they need to go on vacation. They need to do what they need to do, whether it's their personal life or whatever. It's more treated as a family. I mean, right now we have three employees, so it's not like that. We've, we've gone up to six last year. We had six, but because it's so family oriented in our, in our situation, people want to work for us. So we don't have that problem. However, that's a massive problem. Like you said, with um, the industry in general, I mean, people just drop and go to, from done lumber to a contractor to this, to that. So there's a lot of bouncing around that because there's a massive demand. I mean, people can just choose their jobs. There's sort of that, that whole theme was going on in every industry before COVID. It's sort of, you know, it's a job seekers market. They can go out and do whatever they need to do. But uh, at the end of the day, I, c- I could do other things, right? I mean, I have two degrees, but I want to be where I'm at. And so if you treat people well, there's a reason why they stay. There's a reason why there's a good work ethic. It all comes through, the, through on, uh, on your quality of work as well. And, uh, you know, so there can be that issue, not with us because we have very loyal people and we treat them well. So. And, and so you talk about hiring before and how the process works. Let's suppose you need to hire a painter and someone applies for a job and they're from, from Texas, right? You don't know them. They're, they're, they look like they're qualified. Like, how do you vet them? Do you like, do you have like do some kind of small project for you or do you like ask for references or like, no. So again, in this industry, it's all word of mouth. I wouldn't even, I don't even put that out there because I don't need to put it out there. If we needed somebody right now, I could call one of my buddies either part-time that have already painted with me or that are in the industry or Gustavo as well. So it's all word of mouth. So as far as like cold calling and like working for my company, it just doesn't happen. I don't need to go out and like somebody from Texas or like test them out. It's more like a word of mouth on character, sort of like, I would say maybe it's a lost art with the trades, but that's what it is. It's, it's word of mouth. It's a culture. It's a community, you know, back in the day, it was just, Hey, you got a guy who knows how to work hard. And I mean, I even have a buddy of mine at the gym owns a heating and air conditioning company. And he's like, Hey, do you know somebody who could, who wants to kind of come into this industry? that's what it is. He doesn't announce. And I'm talking about, you know, universal mechanic, which is a Redmond based large heating and air conditioning company. He's not out going like, Hey, do you any, any techs? Like anybody can work. Cause it's more about character, honestly, in the trades, because at the end of the day, you can learn, right? The question is, do you have the work ethic? Do you have the drive to want to go up that next echelon to be a sprayer, to be a painter, to be whatever the next rung is? Do you like it? And are you willing to work and sort of at at times have to push through challenges of heat or challenges of, you know, the work being hard or, you know, whatever the case is, it's just way more of, uh, uh, and again, this is my perspective of of a word of mouth community, at least at the level that I'm at. Um, So so from the time you became an entrepreneur to now, what's something that you didn't expect or a challenge you came across, like something like you you didn't expect or like you thought something really easy. It was really hard or unexpected challenge that you weren't expecting. I would say there's sort of a multitude, you know, I wasn't expecting, you know, a massive amount of clients and sort of like this big influx, but I was pretty naive i think a lot of people kind of go into entrepreneurship thinking like everything's gonna go like or you know at least you know you kind of have this picture of what how it's gonna go and i'm gonna get this client and that client 
And I would say there's been like different disappointments on the, on the line, whenever you discuss family or friends or anyone close to you, because once you get into that business, Oh, can you do me a favor? Can you paint this? Can you do this? Or, you know, you kind of get in that industry and I wasn't necessarily prepared for that. Like I had a school teacher recently. Uh, well, I won't lay it out, but you know, sort of, Oh, come out and, and, and estimate my house and sort of like, I really enjoyed her. She was a good school teacher and we had a great conversation. So I hadn't seen her in years. And then it's sort of like you present your numbers so it can make for an awkward relationship. So I would say sometimes when you mix business with friendships or family, it can kind of, I wasn't prepared for that sort of awkwardness at times, or, you know, I would say it kind of, eh, I don't know how to describe that, but going in and estimating houses, I wasn't ready for the ghosting as much either, you know, where if you were to do anything for me, I would at least respond and say, Hey, thank you for coming out. Like, you know, I can't, it's, I can't, it's not within my budget. I can't afford this right now. Yeah, absolutely. Or, you know. Like, and that's no worries. I mean, but just to leave people hanging, I wasn't prepared for the level of, you know, even when I hear just in general, like, clients are going to, Oh, I'm going to, I'm getting three estimates or I'm getting this, I'm getting that. Like the suspicion there is towards contractors. And that's probably partly our fault as an industry because people must've ghosted them or done hard, crappy work. Or there's a lot of times you go in, you know, you've probably heard it. Oh, well, this guy did. Why did he do it that way? Well, you, the last guy you hired did this all goofy or, Hey, they put, you know, I just was at a house and they put all exteriors, a sold home. They put all interior product wood product on the exterior for trim so they took interior trim so it's not prime it's not pine for the outside but they just slapped it on because it's probably three dollars cheaper and they did the whole thing so now it's rotting and failing after a couple of years well now you got to replace it so this idea of there's a lot of suspicion when it comes to sort of a painting uh not painting but just contractors in general i mean it's it's just not one of those things that in the game of entrepreneurship, whether you go to a coffee store or you go to a, a doctor's office, again, when we're talking about negotiating and doing all this and that, like, I guess it all boils down to respect at the end of the day. And I think that there are a lot of people who respect tradesmen, but I wasn't prepared for sort of the ghosting or suspicion or sort of that dealing with them. Um, I with think a lot clients. of it too is like, you know, a, a person goes to contract, they say, hey, I want to remodel my house. I want to redo my bathroom, right? Just basic bathroom, uh -huh. six foot tub, regular stuff, you know. And then by the end of the project, the owner has changed it to like vaulted ceilings, jacuzzis, all the different stuff. And they're complaining like, you told me it was $10,000. Right. Well, you've got all this stuff on. There's no way it can be $10,000 right now, right? Yeah. Or, you know, you're, you're even forthright or, you know, it could be as simple as, hey, oh, okay, da, 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 you guys are kind of done in the, in the beginning I had a little bit of this because I didn't really know how to handle these situations but I'm like oh well can you just get that door down there it's well just, I mean it just take a minute it just take a deal. minute right it'll just take you 10 minutes if you could knock that out for me and it's one of those things where you want to almost say you like, want to please the customer and all that kind of stuff well you do but you also but in the back of your mind you're like oh wow if you could paint that if I if you could paint that in 10 minutes I'll paint your whole house for free type thing you don't want to get on that level but it comes down to like that's an additional potential hour and taken away from my schedule here. Like just painting that little this or that it's like, you know, in general people, it, you know, it comes from an ignorance too, not knowing how long this is going to take, or it's just a painter. If you're not in the industry, it's just like, Oh, you can type up this form. It's like, these things take time. Like I have to put energy for yeah, that fire is not a minute job. Right. So anybody that you're dealing with, whether it's a podcast or you have to set things up, it's not just like, Oh, we just go. Well, I thought you just put a mic and you just go, it's like, no. So, um, that can sometimes be a challenge, especially in the beginning because you're trying to maintain clients. And I think that, uh, that can be a challenge probably for anybody. If you're building a fence or something, you don't, you want to please the customer, but at the same time, you have to be pretty clear in, in what you're trying to do, you know? And, and also, with that in that same vein is sort of like, well, I got three estimate years is much higher than the other ones. You know, why would you da, 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 da? Well, who knows? I don't know a lot about that company, what product they're going to use, what the, 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 you know, three estimates could be completely the same because as I preface this whole conversation is you may want a Ferrari. You may just want a Pinto. Maybe you, you go to a car lot and go, I want a Toyota or I want a Maserati. 
And I'm not saying contractors are the same in that vein, but they can be the same in that vein. I mean, there's contractors that do really, really fine work and they estimate it that way because their labor is really going to be really, really tight. Their, their whole standard is going to be completely different than Billy and Bobo showing up. Same with the Pinto or whatever lower end car you're buying. And you may want that lower end car. So go for it because maybe you just aren't one of those clients that necessarily care, but you don't as a company want to put yourself out there as like, okay, yeah, we can just hand paint your cabinets. And then they look at it and go, I see strokes everywhere. It's like, well, you wanted hand painted cabinets. We just don't want to get involved in that back and forth. We just, we, this is our industry standard. And you have to be, again, in my business, you have to be able to walk from a situation, read a situation and walk if it's not something, because it's, it's a relationship at the end of the day, whether you're getting anything in the services. And so would you, you would be considered like a high end pay company then, right? I would, you know, yeah, at this point, our portfolio with the city of Kirkland, we, I mean, it's not so much high end. I mean, it's like quality glazing, the technique, you know, you have to have experts in order to do these things. And so that's, yeah, that's definitely the vein that I'm in. But when you say high end, I mean, there's small residential homes in Bothell that just want us, want the experience and want a quality pay. We don't treat anybody differently. We don't estimate anything differently. Our estimates always the same. So you could have a client in, uh, in a neighborhood here or a client in a high end neighborhood. I mean, I don't really like to use the word high end, but it's just, we are in the realm of professional. We provide a service and that's sort of where we're at. Because again, in my, in our, in our industry, you could have an unlicensed bonded, just a guy running around in a van. You don't know. I mean, how often do people check people's credentials? Well, you don't if they probably have a website, a, a strong presence. If they're you just presume they took if they're rotor rooter. Yeah. Like who's who's looking at rotor rooter going? Oh, is it rotor rooter? Well, if Billy paints a house or Bobo or whatever name you want to call it, John Doe paints a house and then he says tells the neighbor, oh, I paint. Yeah, I paint. I can paint your house too. And that 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 and word gets around the guy in the van painting the house. I mean, there's a level of quality to that. So maybe you're looking for that, but it costs money to have. So that could be another problem within my industry. I mean, there's people who are out there unlicensed who can, you know, undercut you. Well, we have payroll, we have we pay taxes, we are licensed, bonded and insured. So all those things at the end of the day, protect us, protect you as the customer and also drive the cost a little bit because anybody can undercut you and just drive around in a van and say, I paint it's one of those worlds where you can kind of do that or yeah, I build fences. Well, who knows if you really build fences. So from your point of view, talk about a pro of the painting industry and a con of the painting industry from your point of view. Hmm. I would say a con is actually just more about safety. You know, you never know at the end of the day, you know, if you look at the history of painting, you know, the products that they use, lead lead paint so now you have to do lead paint testing you have to be lead based certified even in the city of seattle so you got guys who weren't wearing respirators just like a coal miner so i would say a con to my industry is making sure that safety and everything's good for my employees as well as myself you know you're breathing these chemicals that's why a lot of people don't want to do it you know go ahead and paint your house spray it and like see how you feel afterwards if you're not wearing a respirator if you're not protected you know and that comes from your eyes that comes from everything wearing smocks and so forth so um, my con and when I look at my business with my employees just to look out for them is, is safety. It comes down to what are they going to say about the latex paint now? I mean, it shows warning labels and so forth and we wear the appropriate masks, but then you have oil-based paint. People are even getting away from oil, but oil protects really well and it covers really well and so forth. So you still have to use it. So, and then you're talking about paint thinner and so forth. So you're using a lot of chemicals in this industry. So to make sure that not only you're protected, but the environment protected them, what, it, what are the changes going to be and how are we going to look back in 20 years and go, man, can you believe these guys were painting with this? <laughs> it's one of those things where, you know, anyway, I won't dwell on it other than that sort of, you get the gist of it. And a pro? A pro is just the ability to be outside, like to be outside, inside, the constant movement of, if you're a painter, you just get to be outside your work environment changes, you know, 
for us on a weekly basis, sometimes monthly basis, sometimes daily basis. And so you meet new people all the time. I mean, I literally, I painted for a children's hospital doctor. I thought, wow, this is incredible. You know, just how many people meet a children's hospital doctor and have to get to interact with them and sort of during, you know, talk to them about masks and so forth. And then I've painted an attorney's house and then I've painted a social worker's house and then I've painted just tons of different people that you meet, you know, your clients become your friends. And I mean, we've, we painted another, another home in Bellevue and, and we were like, wow, your boat looks really nice. And Gus and I fish. So we were like, oh, so where do you, you know, just starking up conversation. Yeah, I'm sure you bring, you have some pretty decent relationships with your customers. Absolutely. And so next thing you know, they're like, oh, well, why don't you come out on our boat and we'll drive you around. I'll show you our little Harbor here, whatever, you know, a uh, Harbor over on this, on this point, stuff like that. So you can just meet really fun people. And I think it's, I think it's awesome just interacting with people when, uh, I look at other people's jobs and you sort of work with your work group and it's a very different relationship when you're working with your supervisor and your coworker and you're this and that and everybody said da, 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 da. or my team is with me and we get to paint for somebody who doesn't have any skin in the game as far as like, you know, being my supervisor where, oh, can I go to lunch with them? It's just, hey, how are you doing? And, and they're discussing my life and your life and you're kind of talking, you get into different conversations and you just meet good people. And so it's, it's, it's really fun actually. Do you see any changes in the painting industry coming up? Like any, anything changing or things being the same? You know, I don't, you know, the big thing that you always hear, like now talking a little bit more futuristic is like, everything's going to go to automation. Pretty soon they're going to have a robot painting. And so you, well, you don't hear that about painting, but you say all oh, the jobs are going away. But like we, like we were just discussing, it's one of those things that not really plumbers are in high demand. If you can frame, we need framers. If you can, build we need build if you have an electrician and i don't foresee that taking over painting anytime soon because good luck getting a robot on the top of the house and crawling under i'm sure there's probably robot people that are like oh they'll be able to do that absolutely but there's so much face to face interaction and there's so much that that i don't see on that and i think it's going to continue for for many many years at least 10 or 20 because i mean they talk about automation during this presidential cycle it seemed like you know andrew yang and people were talking about you know everything's going to be automated out in the next 10 years. And maybe that's true, you know, for a lot of, a lot of office workers, but as far as the trades, you need people, you need human beings to, to get in there. And, and uh, especially in painting, you know, I just can't, I can't foresee a time where it's automated. Obviously they used to paint with, you see them, they're actually like brushes that you would almost scrub a floor with. And then you kind of like a big mop they used to paint. So obviously we have sprayers, so technology can make it faster, but you're still going to need a human behind it. So change the subject. Let's talk about your, ta- your tattoos real fast. Okay. <laughs> so your tattoos, they represent anything or? Oh, yeah, everything. I mean, uh, yeah, I have this bowl here, which is representative of Spain. So I spent three years in Spain. That's kind of one of their national symbols. Um, kind of funny, but I have my wiener dog, my dachshund. And I have the city of Seattle, my mother's name. And then on this side, I have a bunch of roses because I have a daughter. Her name's Rose. She's turning two on Friday, which is pretty fun. Um, I have a motorcycle, which is my motorcycle. Uh, so, yeah, I really enjoy. We actually both have Harleys, Gustavo and I, and a couple of our other friends. So how long have you had your tattoos? I've, I started, you know, when I was 18, okay. right before I went to the military, and then just sort of built on that. So it's a combination of service, family, and just things that I like to do. Yeah. Are you going to get any, any new tattoos? Yeah, I'll probably keep going. You know, nothing. Maybe maybe a chest tattoo or here or there. It's sort of one of those things. I don't know if you have any tattoos, but it's uh, one of those things that you kind of start off in and then people kind of say, hey, keep getting them, keep getting them. I mean, some people just get one or two. Like, I always hear, like, you know, I have two tattoos. But I always hear people say, once you get a tattoo, you get, like, get addicted to it, right? Yeah. You always hear that. I don't know if you do, but I, I don't necessarily get addicted to it, but it's more like, uh, it's not like a lifestyle or anything or a biker lifestyle, but it's just, I like it. A, I think it's, it's just, whether it's a hobby, whether you like riding or getting So out. quickly, let's talk about your time in Europe. Like how fun was that to be in Europe? You know, it was amazing. Again, I was pretty young, 18 to 23. But uh, when I shipped off from Naples, I married my wife. So we were 21 and 18. I've been married almost 15 years now. And so. So is your wife Italian? No, she's here in America. We were high school sweethearts. Okay. 
And so I got orders to spin. It was one of those things where you either get married so we can stay together or do you want to continue a long distance relationship for three years? It's like, no, we already did it for two. So um, the opportunity to have my wife there was awesome, right? So I've, I've seen, I saw actually Pope John Paul. Oh, wow. Yeah, do his last Christmas mass. One of my buddies was taking Italian. And so he got tickets to see that. And uh, just been like uh, a guy like me, I mean, it came from like a single mother household and barely graduated high school. And now I'm skiing in the Alps, you know, snowboarding. So I've been to Switzerland where the Matterhorn is. I mean, I've been all, all throughout the Netherlands and Anne Frank's house. I don't know if you know, everybody's familiar with reading about Anne Frank, but you can walk through her house in Amsterdam, Van Gogh. And so, um, yeah, I had the opportunity yeah, to travel. Yeah, same thing here. My, my, there was my family, like, there were so many things. And, like, like I, I said this in the previous podcast, like, my daughter had, like, a, a Anne Frank project. The, it, 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 I was like, three hours away. Let's go, you know, like. Yeah, so where were you stationed at? You were uh, in Germany? Wiesbaden, in Germany, and okay. then Vicenza, Italy. Yeah. My dad was actually born in Wiesbaden, Germany. He was... Uh, my grandfather was a major in the army, but uh, yeah, it's just such a great opportunity. Again, when I'm like thinking back, you know, I was pretty young. It'd be different being there at 35, yeah. you know, but um, at the same time, it was awesome. I didn't have a car, so I would just run around. And I mean, I was in Southern Italy, Naples, which was just like where pizza was invented. So it was amazing. And Mount Vesuvius, but I think I look back on it more and I've, I've been back a few times now. I have a close friend in the Netherlands, but um it's just when I look back and I'm like, man, what an opportunity because I've been back here for 10, 10 years, solid, like not living overseas. But when I was over there too, you know, you felt this kind of combination of being homesick or wanting to start your life back home as well. So, um, it, it was great. So Sean, can you share your social media so people can reach out to you? Yeah. So my Instagram is GSM lower or lower score. What do they call it? Lower score. Think, yeah, yeah, lower score. Painting. And that's my G that's and then I'm also at gsmpainting.com. Just www.gsmpainting.com. But yeah. So you can check out our portfolio and then hopefully you'll look out for my YouTube channel at some point when I have some time to rock and roll with that. And for our listeners, we'll have those links to our social media on the, on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetshlblog.com. Be sure to share this episode with your friends and your network. So Sean, we're coming in with a talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Um, any wisdom, any piece of advice? I don't know. I mean, on a side note, I was at the state legislature a couple of years ago. I got an internship there. So that was awesome as my last year. So just to talk a little bit about public policy, I think, you know, in this election year and every everything, it's important to get involved and vote. And like we're both veterans, so just get out there and, and uh, be involved in your community. And, and I think uh, that's kind of the note that I want to leave it on. And, and to follow up, one thing that gets me, you know, people, oh, the presidential election, presidential election. Well, that's important, but your local election is probably more important, right? The state legislature, the city councilman, you know, a lot of counties, you know, you elect, for, you elect the sheriff, you know, like no one talks about that. It's all the presidential election, right? Absolutely. And um, I actually worked with representative since Representative Harris, who passed two of the biggest bills here in Washington. One was Tobacco 21 the year that I was there. So it made our state, you have to be 21 or older to buy any tobacco products. And uh, also the MMR vaccine, mandatory for kids to take the measles vaccine because we had an outbreak in Vancouver. So just to bounce off what you're saying, sort of like at the local level, there's so much going on that um, definitely get involved in who your legislatures are because they pass interesting bills and given the fact that we're in COVID now sort of there was a lot of people against mandatory vaccines now everybody's sort of begging for a vaccine so anyway that's sort of a side note but yeah hey Sean thank you for your time today I really appreciate yeah, it yeah I appreciate it too thank you and to our listeners thank you for your time as well and remember to be great every day